2024 is going to be an intense year on the Space Coast, with the debut flight of New Glenn, a final farewell to the Delta IV Heavy, and around 100 predicted SpaceX launches. In this month's flyover, we've spotted actual flight hardware at Blue Origin, the final Delta on the pad, and the critical upgrades to the busiest launch pad in the world. It's an exciting time, so let's get started. It's so good to be back in the air. Yeah, here it is. As always with our Cape flyovers, it's not just my face you get to look at because later on I'll be joined by Adrian and Max for some more in-depth analysis. First though, let's dive into SpaceX's Roberts Road facility. In the time since our last flyover, there have been some interesting developments regarding the Starship launch tower segments that have been built here about a year ago. As you've probably seen in our Starbase update, SpaceX has begun the process of moving these sections halfway across the country. First, it started with the individual pieces for the tower's 8th and 9th sections. These are the ones that make up the top two of the tower. And then, more recently, as you can see, the 7th section is missing as well. That's because in December, SpaceX shipped this section from the KSC Turn Basin to South Texas across the Gulf of Mexico. And that section is currently residing at the port of Brownsville, awaiting an SPMT-assisted roll to Starbase. But if you look closely, that's not all that SpaceX has done to these sections. As you can see, pressure and hydraulic lines have been added to these three sections, which are the three that are closest to the bottom. One interesting consequence of the installation of these lines is that it may indicate where the tank farm for this launch tower will be located relative to the tower itself. At Starbase, the tank farm is in front of the tower, so these lines go up the tower on the front. At 39A, the tank farm lines come from behind, and so they also go up the tower from the back. The lines already installed on these launch tower sections indicate that potentially the tank farm connections for this launch tower will come from behind, just like at 39A. It's an interesting thing to point out, as a lot of people, including us, are wondering where the fabled second tower will end up. Staying with these tower sections, we can also see that teams have begun installing the cable tray system that will eventually carry the organised mess of wires and similar hardware up the tower. Also, all six of these tower segments have had a fresh lick of paint, which should make them look a little more fresh before their trip to Starbase, where inevitably they'll probably get bombarded with salty air. The fourth and fifth tower sections, the segment below and at the height of the ship quick disconnect arm, are also in the process of receiving the cable tray with attachment points already installed on each one. On the sixth tower section, the one right above the ship QD arm, teams have installed two of the pulleys that will be used for the tower's chopstick carriage system. These, along with the tower drawworks, makes up the system that enables this carriage system to move up and down the tower and the chopsticks along with it. Moving over to the north of Roberts Road, we can see that work has resumed on the chopsticks destined for this tower. There is now scaffolding set up around them and teams have already installed the rails that allow these chopsticks to stack and catch super heavy boosters. This is a good sign that perhaps once they arrive in Starbase they'll be mostly complete with minimal on-site work needed. While we're here, a quick check of the chopstick carriage system hardware and the ship QD arm shows that no significant work has happened since our last flyover. If we move down south a little to the Hangar X2 building, we can see a new concrete structure is being built next to this facility. We're not fully sure what this may be for, but hopefully it'll make itself more obvious in the future. Slightly east of Hangar X2, we can also see some work has been done on the ground. This work consists mostly of land clearing and concrete pouring, which could be to make a proper entrance to this side of Roberts Road. It's not a bad idea, given that this same entrance is the one that SpaceX uses when it moves Starlink payload stacks from Hangar X2 all the way to the launch site. And to wrap up the interesting stuff here at Roberts Road, we can see the remains of venerable booster B1058 hanging out by Hangar X. Some hardware has already been removed, although some of the engines are still visible sticking out at the bottom, as SpaceX works to inspect and refurbish as many bits as possible. Now if you thought that was a lot to go through, you're about to be very surprised by Adrian and Blue Origin. Well, 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 before we even dig into what's going on at Blue Origin's Cape facilities this week, I think it's best that we recap everything that has happened since our last flyover. And spoiler, it's quite a lot. On the 10th of January, Blue rolled out the most complete New Glenn first stage that we have seen yet. 
This stage appeared to consist of the tank section that we spotted in our last flyover, however it had since gained its interstage and engine section, making it a full-sized booster. This stage was rolled out past our cameras at the press site and of course our amazing photographers were out there to capture it too. The stage eventually made it out to launch complex 36 and was tacked into the hangar. But the excitement didn't stop there. The day after the rollout, Blue Origin's new CEO David Lim shared an image showing a new Glenn second stage inside of the hangar at LC36. And yes, you're seeing that correctly. There are two BE3U engines integrated onto the aft end of that stage. Just over a week later, Blue Origin had the two new Glenn stages mated inside of the hangar. Together, these two stages add up to be just over 76 meters long. That's bigger than a Falcon 9. But as many pointed out, both stages here have parts labeled not for flight. Does this mean that the whole stages aren't flight hardware or just a few parts that can be swapped out later? We can't be certain. But either way, both stages here seem to be capable of cryogenic testing and should help Blue gain experience with loading and unloading such a large vehicle on a brand new launch complex until dedicated flight hardware is ready. By the way, this was just a recap. We have actually been covering this in way more detail as it happened over the last couple of weeks on This Week in Space Flight and we even made a whole dedicated video about this move. That's another reason for you to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss anything. Speaking of things you really don't want to miss. I can already hear Adrian squealing. Oh, I didn't realize this tank was out here too. Did you see that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've been getting that. Steve, I was looking at that one that's uh, outside. No. That. Two tank sections out today. What are you seeing here may very well be the first flight hardware for New Glenn. Now, let me explain what we think this and most importantly, what part of the rocket this hardware is. At two cats. <laughs> the second stage cleaning and testing facility, there was a second stage lying on cradles just outside of the door. Interestingly, the aft dome of this tank was open and had both an air hose and a ladder going inside of it. This leads to the possibility that crews are inside the tank performing inspections after some testing that had taken place inside 2CAT. We can see here the attachment points for the structure where the two BE3U engines are connected to. As you can see, this tank is pretty early on in its life and is yet to receive a coat of insulation and paint like the one that's currently at LC36. Give that, it could be that this second stage may become a flight article for one of New Glenn's first missions. At 2CAT's big sibling, TCAT, the first stage tank cleaning and testing facility, we have the other tank section lying horizontally on an SPMT. On this tank, we can see the attachment points for the booster strakes on either side of it and on the aft dome, we can also spot the seven pipes that feed propellant to the BE4 engines. So, this is most definitely the liquid oxygen tank for a New Glenn first stage. Like the second stage, this tank has yet to receive any of its insulation and a full paint job. It's likely that this will happen after it's been integrated with its liquid methane tank section. During our flyover, both ends of the tank were rigged up to cranes, so we either captured it just before being lifted into the building or just after it was lowered back onto the SPMT and getting ready to head back to the factory. With the ground test New Glenn booster now at a pad, this means that this tank has to be for a booster much further down the line, so it's most certainly flight hardware. But wait, if you thought that was all of the potential flight hardware, there's actually more. During our flyover we were able to peek through one of the doors at Blue Origin's warehouse and we could spot multiple domes inside of it. Two of them were clearly in the process of transport either away or inside of the warehouse while another dome was sitting unprotected next to them. This dome in particular looks to be the aft dome of a booster liquid oxygen tank as it has a wide opening in the center, similar to what we can already see on the one at the TCAT. By the same rule of thumb as the two tanks we mentioned before, this definitely looks to be hardware way later down in the production line, so unless Blue changes plans dramatically, this has to be flight hardware. Speaking of new Glenn flights, let's go to its launch pad at Launch Complex 36. At first glance, it may not look like it's very active, but as we mentioned earlier, that's not really the case. Sadly, the rocket is inside of the hangar and, well, so far we haven't invented X-ray live streaming to see what's going on inside 24-7.
We do have regular 24 seven optical live streaming of it though. So if you're interested, maybe check out Space Coast Live. Now, despite that slight visual difficulty, there's still stuff to take a look at outside of the hangar and basically all around LC-36. For example, outside of the north entrance to the integration facility, we can see the large transporter rig used to move the New Glenn first stage from the factory out to LC-36. Just next to it is the second stage transporter erector, which should be used to assist in the testing of New Glenn's second stages at the launch pad in the future. We can also see there are some workers up by the launch mount with a number of cars and personnel visible nearby. This could be a sign of preparations ahead of Blue rolling out the mated first and second stage on the transporter erector in the near future. At the northern end of the complex, a new concrete pad has appeared. They also appear to be what could be foundations for propellant lines leading up to where this new pad is located. Pure speculation alert here, but this concrete pad may become the new location for the test stands where Clipper tanks, or previously Jarvis tanks, have been tested. This may be to provide more distance between the Clipper testing site and New Glenn's launch pad. Not a bad idea given the potential for boobs with experimental programs. Near this concrete pad we also spotted lots of piping and storage. Near LC-36 there's also another location where Blue has some interesting stuff going on. If we move to the north of the complex and beyond the tents for Clipper construction, we can see Launch Complex 12. Over the last year or so, it appears Blue Origin has been using the old launch complex for additional storage. But there now appears to be some work going on that signifies a test site of sorts coming together. While we can't get close to see exactly what's going on, there does appear to be some plumbing, storage tanks and some flare stacks at the site. Definitely intriguing and we'll keeping an eye on this location as we never know when Clipper hardware could pop up at this place. One of Blue's biggest customers for launches is also continuing to make good progress with their facilities at KSC. So let's go check in. Amazon's Kuiper Satellite Payload Processing Facility is taking shape at the launch and landing facility. Since our last visit the 100,000 square foot building has continued to gain walls and a roof. A newer smaller structure has started to go up on the western side of the site. In planning documents, this structure is referred to as the in-transit storage building. Several bridge cranes are being stored outside and will eventually be installed inside of the structure's high base. These will assist in moving around the satellites as they are integrated with their fairings. And speaking of satellites, during this flight there was a rather big visitor at the launch and landing facility. It looks like a C5 to me. Yeah, that's a big girl, holy cow. A C-5M Super Galaxy transport aircraft was sitting on the apron after delivering NOAA's GOES-U satellite earlier in the week on January 23rd. GOES-U is the final of four geostationary weather and environmental monitoring satellites in NOAA's GOES-R series of satellites and will be launched on a Falcon Heavy no earlier than late April. As a fun note, the C-5M was also captured from the International Space Station by ESA astronaut Andreas Morgensen. How's that for a flyover? After GOES-U was unloaded, it was transported to the Astrotech Space Operations Facility in Titusville to be prepared for launch. But GOES-U isn't the only thing being prepared for launch at the moment. The 16th and final Delta IV Heavy rocket is currently residing inside of the mobile service tower at Space Launch Complex 37B as ULA is preparing to launch the NROL-70 mission for the National Reconnaissance Office. As of now, Liftoff is slated for no earlier than March of this year, so it's coming up pretty quick. Not only will this be the final launch of an icon that's known for setting itself on fire at engine ignition, but it will also be the final launch from Slick 37 for the foreseeable future. Long live the most metal of rockets. Back in mid-January, or a couple weeks ago, Stoke Space submitted planning documents as well as an environmental report ahead of gaining permits to begin construction of their launch pad at Space Launch Complex 14. In the application, Stoke noted that the launch complex design is still being finalized at this time, and they are applying for a concept permit that will later be modified once the overall design is complete. Simply put, these conceptual plans show a fairly straightforward layout with a horizontal integration facility, tank farms, flare stacks, retention ponds, and of course the launch pad itself. As part of these plans, Stoke submitted a very detailed environmental report which is standard for all construction projects similar to this, both at the Cape and the Kennedy Space Center. The 182 page document goes into great detail regarding the predicted impacts of the existing habitats of wildlife, such as birds and our beloved reptiles. 
KSC security usually gets pretty grumpy with the noise that's becoming all too frequent around here nowadays. So be sure to keep you in the loop once we have more up-to-date planning documents and hopefully we'll, we'll have eyes on and some solid hardware coming here soon. Continuing on with the industry's growth here at the Cape, in mid-October, OneWeb filed plans to expand its satellite production facility just outside of the Kennedy Space Center. This building sits across the road from Blue Origin's production campus, which Adrian was probably gushing over a few moments ago. The plans show a building expansion of 49,000 square feet, as well as a brand new parking garage. During our flight, we saw the first stage of preparations for this expansion. We can see a temporary parking area, some heavy machinery, and some portable buildings have already appeared on site. Over at the crawler yard, Mobile Launcher 2 construction is still ongoing, now with a sizable amount of steel having been assembled. But there is still a lot of work to do as we are still years out from Mobile Launcher 2 entering service for the Block 2 variant of SLS. At LC39B, Mobile Launcher 1 is still hard down and undergoing testing, but now we can see the slide wire baskets cabling following its installation. It has also recently undergone its first drop test. These baskets will serve as a rapid escape system on the mobile launcher in the event of an emergency. It's not just SLS's launch pad that is receiving work at the Space Coast. As our teams flew over the Cape, we were able to spot crews very busy working at both of SpaceX's launch pads in Florida, Launch Complex 39A and Space Launch Complex 40. Pretty. Bird? Where? 39A. And back it up. <gasps> How dare you? Move your camera. It's on my side. <laughs> wow, okay, fine. At LC-39A, the Falcon Transporter Erector, or TE, has been undergoing modification and upgrade work to support the loading of cryogenic liquid oxygen and liquid methane into Falcon 9's fairing. Now, that's a capability that will sound very unnecessary to the uninformed, but it does have a purpose. This will be used on the upcoming Intuitive Machines 1 mission carrying the Nova Sea lander. This lander uses a Methalox propulsion system to land on the moon, and in order to reduce the amount of boil off, SpaceX agreed to undergo these modifications and supply the propellant via the TE during Falcon 9's countdown instead of fueling the payload before it is integrated onto the vehicle inside of the hangar. We already saw a potential test of this system on January 21st when we observed the strong back venting at a place substantially higher up in the structure than normal. After that, we also observed venting from a nearby tank that we believe is part of the methane tank farm used for this upgrade. All of this work at 39A is also being done whilst the pad is being refurbished after the Axiom 3 mission and before the upcoming Starlink Group 638 mission, which should have launched by the time of publication. At Slick 40, crews are also busy working on upgrading and improving the launch pad ahead of the crazy cadence set to occur from here in 2024. SpaceX is aiming for a 24-hour turnaround by the end of the year, and that means changing a lot of systems to be able to support this goal. At the same time, employees are working on the ground support equipment needed for the first launch of Cygnus on a Falcon 9. For that mission, SpaceX has designed a 1.5 by 1.2 meter hatch on the side of Falcon 9's fairing in order to be able to perform the late load cargo on Cygnus, a requirement in Northrop Grumman's Commercial Resupply Services 2 contract. According to SpaceX's William Gerstenmeyer, a special environmentally controlled enclosure will be installed against the fairing to be able to do this work. If we look closely at these pictures, this trailer looking thing here looks very similar to what SpaceX already used with the old Dragon 1 capsules for the late load of cargo, so this could be that piece of hardware that Gersten Meyer mentioned. Slick 40's crew access tower is also visibly being worked on, and perhaps it may be to install what could be the emergency egress system at the pad, similar to what we can see on other crew capable launch pads. That's the fancy name for the big zip lines. Just before we come into land at Port Canaveral, we can see quite a few of the vessels from SpaceX's fleet are missing. The drone ship, just read the instructions, and fairing recovery vessel Doug have sailed up to Charleston, South Carolina for refurbishment work ahead of what is poised to be the busiest year on record for SpaceX's fleet. We can visibly see the impact of this quick pace on this fleet by taking a look at the scars left over on the deck of a shortfall of Gravitas after all of the landings that have battered the autonomous spaceport drone ship. And of course, we're looking forward to more launches and landings here from the Space Coast. With Blue's new Glenn now visibly in production, we may not be that far away from seeing the company's recovery hardware appearing at this very port. I'm Ryan Caton for NSF, thanks for watching and goodbye.